Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alan Tusse. I am the community liaison officer for the Dominica Geothermal Development Company. On behalf of the DGDC, I want to welcome you today to this public consultation. Before we proceed, let me introduce the rest of the Dominica Geothermal Development team to you, so at least you'll get acquainted with them. To my extreme left is Mr. Fidel Grant, financial controller. Mr. Rawlings Bruni, electrical engineer. Mr. Dalton Ilwa, mechanical engineer. And to my extreme right is Mr. Mark Tompkins, the project manager. Also with us is a member of the consulting group from, of Jacobs from New Zealand, Mr. Alistair Brooks. Mr. Brooks is the program manager for the Caribbean Geothermal Technical Assistance. Um, the Minister of Energy and Trade was supposed to be here with us today, so I have to apologize for his delayed appearance. This morning, this public consultation will primarily be in three parts. In the first part, Mr. Mark Tompkins will give an update of the project, what we have done so far, and a timeline for what we will do in the near future. In part two, Mr. Brooks will give an overview of the ESIE, that is the Environmental, Social, and Impact Assessment. This is the primary reason why we are, why, why we are here to, today. The third part will be question time. Please allow the presentations to be complete before we ask any questions, okay? So without any further ado, I will call on Mr. Mark Tompkins, the project manager, to give us an overview of the geothermal project. Can you give a round of applause, please? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Alan, for introductions. And um, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, just a little bit more of an introduction of myself. Um, as you've probably gathered, I'm not from Dominica. Um, I'm actually here uh, as part of uh, aid provided by the Government of New Zealand uh, to help Dominica develop this geothermal project. I've been here in Dominica for about 18 months now. I uh, was unfortunate enough to experience Hurricane Maria uh, and I will be here for the duration of the project. So I have a, an update on the project which I'd like to just go through uh, and basically uh, show you what we've done to date and show you what's going to happen in the, in the near future. Okay, so um, what are we doing? So the intention is that we're going to build a geothermal power plant uh, of about 7 megawatts capacity up at uh, Lodak. Um, some of you probably know already that the wells, the geothermal wells for providing the steam and for re-injection of the fluids have already been drilled and tested. If you care to go up to Loda and Watton Waven or Trafalgar, you will see the wells. We have a number of wells. The first one is the, what we call the production well, which is going to be our source of hot steam. And it's called WWP1. Uh, it's located at, at Loda. We have a number of re-injection wells, uh, which are called WWR1, it's located in Trafalgar, and WW01 at Watton Waven. And these wells are where we put fluids we've taken out of the ground back into the ground. I'll explain that a little bit more in a, mo in a moment. And whilst we're going to be building the power plant up at Lorda, we also have to um, connect the power plant to the re-injection wells, and we have to connect that using what we call a re-injection line, a pipeline, which will run from Lorda to Trafalgar, uh, Watton Waven. Uh, it's a 12-inch line with insulation, and it'll be run over a, a corridor approximately 10 metres wide. Uh, and most importantly, we have to get the electricity that we're generating from this power plant into the uh, Domlek grid for distribution to the customers. 
and that's going to be achieved by our underground power cables uh, between our plant and Domlek's Lauda hydro plant. So, and this is a question that comes up quite often at some of these sessions, so I thought I'd actually try and, and get ahead of it and explain why geothermal. Um, there's some good reasons why geothermal is a good choice here. Geothermal plants operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, producing electricity. So what does that mean? That means that a geothermal plant can be used to directly replace the diesel plants that are currently producing the bulk of your electricity here, which is a good thing. Um, you're very fortunate that the proposed location of the geothermal plant up in Loda is actually very close to Rosu. So Rosu is the, the main area on Dominica where power is consumed. So having the generation plant in such close proximity is actually uh, very fortuitous and it makes for a very efficient system. Geothermal plants are highly resilient in their nature. They're, they're not really affected by adverse weather conditions because the fuel source is underground. Uh, the plant on the surface is actually relatively minor and is, it can be constructed in a very resilient fashion. And they also have a small footprint, so they don't take up a lot of space. So solar and wind. Um, solar choice here, obviously, because you have lots of sunlight. But because solar is an energy source that only works during daylight hours, obviously, solar is better suited to what I would call daytime peak loading. So during the day, when the load goes up from small businesses and commercial operations, solar would be an ideal uh, solution to help reduce some of that uh, peak demand and supplement what comes from the geothermal plant. Wind, uh, I think wind's possibly a good choice here, uh, but probably a better choice for some of the more remote communities. So you know, the eastern side of the island could be well suited for, for wind generation. But here in Rosu area where we have a, a large consumer base and we have a, a good distribution network with generation plants, uh, the hydro plants up the valley, it makes very good sense for a, a geothermal plant to be connected to that system. Is geothermal something that's new? No, it's not. Geothermal power plants have been around since the 60s. Uh, and this slide gives you a, a sort of a rough illustration of, of the plants that are installed around the world. Um, so to put it in context, plant we're looking at here in, in order is seven megawatts. For example, the, my home country, New Zealand, we have something in the order of 1,000 megawatts worth of geothermal plants operating. There are geothermal plants all around the world where there are geothermal resources. So Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, Kenya has a number of plants. And there are plants in Central uh, American regions, so Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica have plants, and your neighbouring island, Guadalupe, also has a, has a plant as well. So it's nothing new. It's been around for a while. It's, it's well-proven technology. Uh, and um, the, the number of plants installed in the world continues to grow. Uh, countries like Kenya, for example, They've probably got another four or five hundred megawatts coming online in the next uh, two to three years. So it's a, it's a growing source of energy throughout the world. Okay, so I already touched on this, but just to re-emphasize, the, the wells, so what do I mean by a well? We drill into the ground a bit like drilling an oil well, except what we're drilling for is steam. So we're drilling for hot fluids that we can use to generate electricity from. So that's what I mean by a well. So we have already drilled our production well, which is where we're getting the steam from, and our re-injection wells, which is where we take the fluid once we've extracted the energy and re-inject it back into the ground. They were drilled and tested back in 2014. 
Um, as I mentioned before, the production well is up near the Domlek balancing tank, and if you go past the tank on the way to T2 Gorge, you'll see it on your left-hand side. Reinjection wells, uh, one at Watton Waven, uh, next to the, the thermal areas there, and there's another one down at Trafalgar next to the uh, playing field. Uh, at this stage, we're not planning on drilling any more wells, uh, although that is subject to a retest of the production well, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Okay, um, I hope you can see this. It's possibly a little bit trickier from the back of the room, but I'll um, explain the key salient points. So this is a aerial photograph of the project area. Um, up here, we have the power plant site. So this area here is proposed to be the actual power plant. That's the Domlek balancing tank just there, and our production well WWP1 sits just there. The reinjection wells that we're looking to use are at Watton Waven down here and Trafalgar. In between, we have this grey line, which, as I mentioned before, it's our reinjection line, and that's going to be taking fluid from the power plant up here and transporting it all the way down to Watton Waven and then Trafalgar. We have some interesting challenges on this line. Um, for those of you that remember the aerial tramway, we're actually passing right past the old aerial tramway building and we have to build a suspension bridge across this gorge. And then down here, we have to traverse down a uh, near vertical cliff. So we have a, another interesting technical challenge there. We have another small crossing down here um, and that basically is the extent of the system. So this will be a pipeline, and then the power plant will be located up here. So just a quick sort of overview of what, what we're actually doing in terms of the, the process. So this little slide here is a cross-section through Dominica. What it's showing down here is, is the, the Earth's mantle, so this is the source of our heat. This heat comes up through the Earth's mantle and it heats water, groundwater that's deep within the Earth's crust. We've drilled down, and this well here is the production well, we've actually drilled down below sea level. So our well goes down uh, a long, long way. Um, and it's drawing hot fluids from down this area of the rock, way below sea level. We take that up to the power plant, goes through our power plant, we extract the energy, turn it into electricity, and then the fluid, the cold fluid, then flows down the reinjection line to one of our reinjection wells, and it goes back down into the earth, whereby it then flows through the rock, and it cracks in the rock and gets reheated to come back up again. So it's a closed system. What we take out, we put back in again. And the Earth's source of heat is, for all intents and purposes, infinite. It's a, it's a source of heat that's going to be there for billions and billions of years. So if you have a look at the scale there, uh, and apologize if, if you're more familiar with, with feet, but the bottom of our production well is about 450 metres below sea level. The bottom of our, or one of our reinjection wells is about 630 metres below sea level. Um, Alistair will touch on it a little bit later in regards to surface features, but um, the important thing to note is that we are a long, long, long way below ground level. So I mentioned this reinjection pipeline. So this is the line that's going to come from the power plant all the way down to Watton Waven and Trafalgar. That's kind of what one way looked like. Um, I think that particular photo is from Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and our line will look probably something like that. So there'll be a small clearing where the pipeline is built. And then the, um, the forest will be left intact either side of it. So it has some impact, but relatively minor. Um, there's no 
regular maintenance of that required really it would be occasional checks to make sure it's um, operating normally. So largely the forest will be left undisturbed around it. Okay, a little bit more on the power plant site itself. Um, so this is a, a blow up from the earlier slides. So again, this is the Domlek balancing tank, just so you can understand where we are. T2 Gorge is, is just over here. So our power plant site is, is just up here above T2 Gorge um, and will be, won't be visible from T2 Gorge because of the topography. Um, our production well, P1, is down here on the well pad next to the Domlek balancing tank. And there's our little pipeline that we've just been talking about, which will go out, follow the T2 Gorge Road, cross over the road down by the car park, uh, using a small pipe bridge before it heads off down towards Watton Waven. What's the power plant going to look like? Um, well, at the moment, we have a, a couple of options, if you like, uh, in terms of the technology. Um, because of the nature of the resource we have here, it's not definitively one or the other. So there's, 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 there's basically two types of technology that exist in the world. The one on the left is called an organic Rankine cycle, and the one on the right is known as a, a flash steam condensing cycle. So what, you may say, well, there's a slight difference between them. The one on the left has a larger footprint, so it takes up more area, and that's because it uses um, larger cooling systems. It potentially generates less visual vapour. So what do, what do I mean by that? What you see here is steam vapour coming off, which is obviously visible. These plants here tend to not produce very much, so they, they tend to have a very low uh, visual um, impact in terms of the water vapour. However, uh, these plants are, are less efficient at converting steam to electricity, and they're also typically more expensive to build. So the other type of plant, the condensing plant, um, it's basically the opposite. So smaller footprint, so it's more compact in size. However, it will produce somewhat more visual vapour. Uh, but on the plus side, uh, they're more efficient at converting steam into electricity, so we get more electricity out of it. And they also cost less to, uh, to build. Which one we will end up with, we don't know yet. When we go out for bids, we are leaving it open and we're going to decide based on who provides us with the best technical solution at the least cost. Project financing. Okay, you may have seen some articles in the paper recently. Um, so just last week, uh, we have completed uh, negotiations with the World Bank. It basically is an um, accumulation of, of a lot of effort that's gone on over the last uh, few years. So we've had to do a number of feasibility studies to, to prove the viability of the project. Um, we've had to do an environmental social impact assessment, which Alastair is going to talk to you about, and that's a, that's a major undertaking. We've had to do a lot of study on the natural environment, the effects on the social uh, aspects of the community, what it's going to mean, and, and how we're going to mitigate any potential negative impacts from that. It's taken a lot of time, but we've now got to the point where all those things are done, uh, and the World Bank has, um, uh, as I said, we've had negotiations with the World Bank and they've been successfully concluded. I think it's not quite signed yet, but it's not close, not far away. What does that mean? Um, the next step will be a, a formal approval by the World Bank of the project and that's scheduled to occur on the 20th of March. And at that point, then the, the monies that are scheduled for this project will become available. Um, there is approximately $12 million in grant money provided for this project. And grant money is money that's not required to be repaid. So it's, it's been uh, provided by companies or by organizations wishing to promote clean energy, such as geothermal. Uh, there is a further $9 million available as grant money 
to drill a new well if we require it, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there's 17 million, which is a loan from the World Bank, so that is subject to be repaid, but over a very long time. And the interest rates provided are, for all intents and purposes, virtually zero. So you only really have to pay the capital back on it. And then there's another $2 million in aid money that have come from the New Zealand government, which is partly funding me and partly was funding the work that Jacobs did uh, to help develop the ESIA, which, which was a, a fairly massive undertaking. So, what happens next? Well, um, as I mentioned, the next major step really is the actual approval by the World Bank in March. Uh, but we've also got some other things coming up. Um, we're going to be doing a retest of the production well, uh, and that's scheduled for April. I'll explain a little bit more about what that is in the next uh, few slides. We're also uh, planning on going out for uh, bidding for the main construction of the power plant. Uh, we're hoping that that will happen in May, uh, sorry, in February, which we're in now, um, and that will, will take a, a, an approximately five to six months to go through the whole bidding process. Um, so the intention is that we're going to have a single contract for the construction of the power plant and the reinjection line, and it will be a turnkey contract, so at the end of it we get a fully operational plant. The other thing that's happening at the moment is land acquisition, uh, which is a very important activity. So in order for us to build the power plant and the re-injection line, uh, we've identified about 13 properties that are affected. Um, the process of acquiring the land is, is a responsibility of the government of Dominica uh, because of the nature of what it is. So the government of Dominica will be undertaking land valuations, negotiations with the landowners, and then ultimately uh, acquisition and payment for the lands. A very important thing to note is that in the World Bank loan documents, there is a clear stipulation that we are not allowed to commence any construction works on the lands until the lands have been acquired. So. We can't just go barreling onto the land and just say, oh, here we are, we're starting. It all has to be acquired, settled and paid for before we can do anything. So that's what I call pre-construction phase. Uh, and that's what's happening now. Construction phase, so once we've got our bids out for construction and we've got them back and evaluated and we've decided who we're going to award it to, then we plan on commencing construction of the plant mid this year, uh, and that construction period will last 18 months. That's what it's defined as being in the documents. So sort of some major sort of, I guess, um, elements to that. The first two months of that 18 months is going to be largely earthwork, so clearing the site, establishing the site. Uh, that will be followed by probably seven to nine months of major civil works and construction. So during that initial sort of two to nine months, there's going to be a lot of heavy equipment moving into the area, a lot of earth moving equipment, uh, and a lot of uh, people influxing into the area as well. After that time, it will settle down and the plant gets into more of a steady state construction phase. Uh, and the, the amount of heavy machinery will, will, will back off as we move into more mechanical and electrical works. And then the last three months of the 18 months will be our testing and commissioning phase. Um, there'll be uh, some times during that when the plant will create quite a lot of noise, unfortunately. There's some tests that we have to do that do generate a lot of noise. They won't be normal operational type events. They'll be one-off things that we have to do during testing. But We'll be managing that with the local community. So once it's finished construction, um, late 2020, it will then move into an operational phase, um, generating power, selling it to Domlek, and then Domlek will be distributing it to the customers. 
Um, there'll be some ongoing maintenance required. There'll be shutdowns probably annually when we'll have some more equipment and people moving in and out. But essentially once it is operating, the plant will go into a much um, less activity around the area. A few people there required to operate it and maintain it, but not a great deal of activity. Okay, so I mentioned this a few times, the well retest. So I don't know if any of you were around when we tested the initial well, well I wasn't there personally. But back in uh, 2014, after the wells were drilled, they had to be tested. So we had to establish if they actually produced enough steam. So in order to test them, basically the, the steam is allowed to discharge out of the well and it goes through some equipment and we, we test and we measure the flow rates and the pressures and the temperatures and, and then we can establish the condition of the well. Um, the well has been essentially closed in, shut in since 2014 uh, and because it's been shut in for a while, in order to understand what condition of the well is now, we're going to retest it. So that retest is going to happen April this year not definitive yet because we're, we're still trying to sort out a number of items of equipment and resources that we need to do that test. But when it does happen, um, there's going to be a bit of disruption to the local community. There's a bit of steam generated, a bit of noise. For example, we'll probably have to close the road to T2 Gorge for one day just when we initially opened the valve uh, because of some gases that are initially released after the well's been sitting cold for a while. Uh, but we're going through a process now, and in fact, Rawlins is, is um, you know, heading up a, a bit of an organisation to uh, arrange the necessary community engagement, uh, emergency services engagement, to manage the whole process. Because it's, it's a significant undertaking. Um, but for us, it'll be a, a nice reassurance that the well, hopefully, is still healthy and ready to be used for the, the power plant. If it's not, if we do find those issues, then potentially we have to drill a new well. Uh, and if you recall back on the financing slide, there is money available to do that if we need to do it. If we do dr drill a new well, it's likely to be in the same area, possibly from the same um, pad even there, but we don't know yet. Hopefully that doesn't have to happen. But we have some contingency there. All right, um, that's really my project update. As Alan said, we're happy to take questions, but after Alistair's done his presentation on the ESIA. So I will hand you over to Mr. Brooks. Good morning, and uh, thanks Mark for that update, I think it's um, very useful to see how the project's developed. I've been coming to Dominica for the last five years. I work for Jacobs Engineering, it's a consulting company, it's a global consulting company. I'm based in New Zealand, and as part of my role, I spent two years living in Grenada and San Lucia, helping governments around the region with their geothermal developments. And part of that in Dominica consisted of helping organize funding to do the environmental and social impact assessment, to help define the project, um, and to engage with the World Bank to prepare it uh, in a way where the loan could be made available. Um, subsequently, the Dominica Geothermal Development Company has been established, and for me personally, it's great to see the, the faces up here. Some of them become very familiar to me, um, and it's good to have a countryman in living here to actually help the project succeed. So my role has been quite wide-ranging. Um, I was the, the, I guess, the team leader for the environmental and social impact assessment. Um, and I'll give you a summary of the findings. The full document is available on the website. It's not an easy read. It's very technical, but it's been done to a high standard, and that's what's required in order to, to deliver them to that standard. Um, it comprises a team of about 12 people, each of them with particular specialities. Um, and is a, a fairly rigorous process. 
I mean, the, the clue's in the title, right? An environmental and social impact assessment. What we do is we look to see how a project is going to impact the environment and the society in which it's to be developed. They use lots of words around it, um, but, but really it's around what happens during the construction, during the operation, and at the end of life. And to help us understand how significant any impacts might be, who they affect, and what you're going to do over the course of the project to either remove them or to mitigate them and manage them. Um, it was completed to the World Bank Group International Standards. So as a funding agency, the World Bank has become very uh, focused, and in fact all international funders are, on the environmental and social impacts of projects. The reason they're interested in it is because it can affect how a project is, um, how the return is paid on their project. For example, if you did a project and there was a, an uprising and the project couldn't operate, then they wouldn't be able to generate revenue. And that general, then if they can't generate revenue, they can't repay their, um, their loan. So uh, it's also, you know, the, the idea behind the project is it does social good and good for the country, economic good, so they want to be involved in good projects. The process itself, um, well, we've got here September 2016, we prepared a terms of reference. Uh, in itself, that's several pages, and was um, relayed to the physical planning department. We had discussions with them. We had discussions with the World Bank Group. And eventually, that becomes uh, agreed. And I attended a number of community consultations, mainly in the Valley, mainly in Laudat and Trafalgar, to talk about the process of the environmental impact assessment and how we were going to engage with different groups. Over the course of nearly two years, the environmental and social impact was, assessment was completed. Obviously, Hurricane Maria happened in September, and uh, that meant that we had to reevaluate some of the impacts because, of course, a hurricane has a greater environmental impact than any geothermal plant will ever have, but also society was impacted and we needed to reevaluate um, how it would change the relationship with the geothermal project. So it added a little bit of time on. And there's quite a long, uh, extensive process of engagement with the World Bank, with the community, um, during this consultation period where we're at now, to make sure that they, uh, everything's been covered in a way in which it's supposed to have been covered. So the disclosure of the environmental and social impact assessment was October. And as part of the World Bank funding agreement, they have a 120-day public consultation period, which is what we're in now, um, where they will not approve a project at the board, which means it isn't actually finally signed off until that 120-day period has passed and it's been made public around the world. Anyone can comment on it to make sure that the, the people are given a chance to discuss it and make sure their concerns are listened to and dealt with appropriately. So when we say what's an impact, well, there's some fancy words there around resource or receptors. Um, basically, how is it going to change the area in which the project operates? The resource itself is the geothermal resource. The receptors are the people, the animals, the air, the water around the project. And, and anywhere beyond the project, what they call the area of influence changes for each of the impacts. So, for example, noise is mainly going to affect the uh, area closest by to the power plant. Whereas uh, the water, if there was an effect on water quality, that would run down into Rozo. And the, the level of impact um, ranges from major to moderate to minor to negligible. And right at the outset, we do something called a, a red flag review. And that's to say, well, are there any impacts that are so severe that they're never going to be managed, they're never going to be mitigated, and therefore the project shouldn't proceed? At that point in time, we look at it and say, well, in general, there aren't any that we think are going to be so significant that means the project is going to create unmanageable social environmental impacts. Um, and the way that the, the uh, experts determine the impact is how long they're going to impact an area and the area of extent, the spatial area through which they impact them. And then you propose mitigation measures for anything that is of minor, moderate or major significance. So before you can assess if there's an impact, you have to know what the existing baseline is. Um, there was an extensive survey done with, with assistance from the French uh, Development Agency in 2015, 
and what they call the baseline surveys. And so they take readings around the area of all these different aspects. So air quality, noise levels, water quality, ecology and natural resources, and the landscape and visual aspects, and then the natural, um, the natural hazards. Um, they also do the, you know, the social um, condition, but we're just talking environment here. Um, that in itself is a fairly extensive document. And um, it creates uh, a point from which you can say, well, what are any impacts going to be and how are you going to assess them? So I talked through each of the findings here from all those areas. So we start off with the air quality and public health. There are the impacts, well, there's minor temporary impacts during construction from dust. That's pretty common during a construction project. There's uh, ways in which you can manage that. And then hydrogen sulfide releases. Those of you familiar with the geothermal features in Watt and Waven will be familiar with the smell that you get there. That will increase um, just around the power plant area, but for the rest of the project side, it won't change at all. And the reason it increases at the geothermal project plant area is because you're bringing up geothermal fluids, you're separating gas out, and obviously then when you separate gas out, you get an increased concentration because at the moment, you don't tend to smell it in Laudat. However, there's no, uh, the, the levels predicted are uh, expected to be well below the World Health Organization thresholds for levels that would cause any significant effects to people, adverse effects. Um, and over the course of the project, that'll be monitored. It's monitored on site because obviously people working there, they need to know what the hydrogen sulfide levels are. Also be measured in, uh, in Rozo. And during the, the construction, there's a dust uh, an air quality management plan which includes how you manage dust um, during construction. We'll talk a little about, a bit about how those things come to reality uh, at the end. I think Mark mentioned noise. So during construction, there's obviously construction works, there's diggers, there's concrete mixers and so on. And there'll be uh, welding. The most important one is perhaps the steam blowing, um, which will be fairly noisy. Uh, intermittently over a three month period, usually one to two hours at a time, and in those periods uh, would be restricted to daytime activity. And then in operation, the power plant itself has a noise level. Um, what we do is when we prepare documents to go to, to market to a contractor, we say, we need the plant to operate within these levels. How are you going to achieve that? And then they provide a response and says, okay, we achieve it by putting in this concrete or by using this equipment. Um, and then you can um, test to see if they've uh, achieved that and you should be able to assess it through their noise modeling during the evaluation. Um, so what we do, this is uh, the outputs of a noise model. That's the power plant site. Here you can just about see Laudat West. There's the road coming into Laudat. This is the decibels, so we've got 45 here, which was the nighttime one. And as you could see there, it doesn't start to uh, impact any of the residences um, to the south of Lauda. Um, there'll be some plantings that help manage the noise and right around the site itself, then obviously it's a little noisier. Um, but in general, noise is not expected to be a, um, a significant impact and the contractors will have to show us how they're going to make sure that they achieve those standards. In terms of water quality, um, the plant doesn't require water to run. Um, on, a, on a daily basis, you require water for general cleaning purposes. So the main impact on water quality is during the construction and when you take vegetation away, you can get erosion, you can get runoff, uh, which could run into the Rosa River. Um, also, where we would construct um, bridges to, to cross the rivers, there could be potential for erosion there. And the way that that is managed is you have a, a management plan and control procedures put in place. So the, um, the contractors will say how they're going to manage any runoff. And, and what they do is basically put in tanks that, that capture sediment. They call them here interceptors, silt fences, and sumps to reduce sediment runoff um, and to create clean water diversions. 
and a monitoring program is put in place and if they don't achieve what they said they would achieve then they have to stop work and rectify it until that is taken care of. In terms of the ecology, so there was a baseline study done in 2015, then there was a further study done and that was um, right when Hurricane Maria hit, the, the people were up in, in the valley um, doing, what they do is they take transects across different areas, they measure how many animals they see and they record the number of different species and so on. We also engaged with the UNESCO team because of the World Heritage status. Um, the World Heritage status of, of the Montois Piton National Park relates to uh, some endemic species, some frogs, the parrots, and there's five which are identified as being of significance, five species which are identified as significance. So the impacts, the overall ecolo ecological impacts are relatively minor because it's not in virgin forest. The area chosen for the power plant is currently farmland. The pipelines that run through the area are themselves 30 centimetres wide. The corridor might be up to 10 metres, so it's not a massive um, physical barrier. Um, we say that there could be changes in the fish habitat from the water quality on a temporary basis. So if there's a lot of sedimentation and runoff, then that would have an impact on the water quality, which in turn could impact the fish. Um, it would be a temporary thing. And um, we said there's no habitat loss or a, neg a negligible impact on the Montois Piton National Park. And the actual border from the park, and this was a, we spent a lot of time talking about this particular aspect because UNESCO were um, invited to attend and it was concern um, to the project team, to the government and to the World Bank. They didn't want to have any impact on that UNESCO heritage rating. Uh, so the project itself is about five or six hundred meters from the border. Obviously, the, the, since Maria, the, 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 the National Park or the, the Montois Piton National Park is recovering and, and it will come back in a different way to how it was beforehand. But um, it, it's certainly an area that was given a lot of focus and um, was, a, was a big concern. In terms of the mitigation and monitoring, so Really, the, the erosion and sediment control we mentioned before is the key thing for the, um, the, the fish during the construction. We have a landscaping and replanting regime. So after, you obviously have an area where there's a geothermal plant, um, but you have areas around it that get affected during construction and they'll be replanted in native species, or Mark may have more details about what he thinks will be going there um, in time. Uh, and then really the key thing is the ongoing monitoring of any impacts. So as I mentioned, after Maria, the environment's been completely changed. The baseline has been completely changed. And so you would say, well, anything that happens there improves the environment. It's very difficult to see what's actually happening as a result of it, as a result of the project. So the way we look at it now is to say, well, look, we'll monitor it regularly. We'll see how the species return and, um, and, and report that and record that. And if there's anything that comes up that looks unusual, then you, know, you take, take action. Uh, so the landscape and the visual aspects, I mean, it's an important tourist part of the island, you know, Laudat and the Rosa Valley. Um, short term, obviously, there's some impacts during construction. The actual site is kind of hidden behind a hill, so there will be some, but it's, it's probably not too severe. Um, once it's in operation, there'll be plantings to hide the main power plant um, and, and keep it sort of not not totally sort of outside out of mind, but not have it as a, as a prominent feature. Um, the corridor itself is unlikely to provide a major visual impact. Where it crosses the gorges, that won't be visible from Trafalgar Falls. Um, when you come up to Titu Gorge, you would see a pipeline going across, and you, there'd be a pipeline running down the cliff, um, but that over time will get um, plants growing up it. It won't take long before there's plants covering it up. And the, the pipeline itself will be coloured in a way which reduces the, the visual impact. The natural hazards, so natural hazards really is landslides uh, and the geothermal features. People talk about earthquakes. There's, there's been no um, recorded earthquakes as a result of geothermal projects. There is one which is quite well known in Europe, which people often bring up, 
It's a different kind of technology. That's a, a system where they go into the ground and they, uh, they fracture it. Um, but it doesn't create earthquakes. And it's something that living in New Zealand, there was a very big earthquake in 2011. Some people may remember it in Christchurch. About 135 people died. Um, there's 1,000 megawatts of geothermal power. Not related at all. They're on different islands. There's absolutely no relation between the two of them. So the main features we talk about here, uh, some risk of flooding as occurred during Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria. And the geothermal features, as Mark mentioned, they're not anticipated to be impacted as the words 1,000 meters below ground level, more than 450 meters below sea level. And as you will know, those features run out at about 300 meters above sea level. Um, it's something that is monitored closely, and particularly in New Zealand, because of the cultural significance for the Māori people of the geothermal features, and we've got a lot of experience in that and in consenting that, so the management system will um, certainly take account of how those features may change over time, what's a natural occurrence and what's actually an impact of the geothermal project. In some cases, it could improve them. In other cases, it might deplete them. And then one of the other things we talk about here is the emergency response and management. So how are you going to manage the geothermal project in the event of an emergency to make sure that it doesn't um, create any additional uh, negative impacts? That's the picture that Mark showed of the wells, as you can see, long, a long way below ground level. Um, I think we're nearly at the end of the environmental impacts traffic. We did some traffic baseline monitoring. Obviously, during construction, there's an impact. Um, one of the mitigation measures for that is the traffic management plan, which the contractor has to provide, and also a workers' camp. The camp will be based up in, the, up in Laudat to reduce the number of cars going up and down. Um, during, you know, when there's heavy equipment, it'll be quite slow to move it up to site, and on those days, um, it would be a little bit disruptive, but um, I think it just takes a coordinated effort so people understand what's happening. So move on to the community and social impacts. Uh, there'll be some employment creation during construction and during operation. Um, most of the, uh, the, the jobs during construction will be for unskilled and semi-skilled workforce. Um, not, a, not a massive number of people. Difficult to say exactly how many, but we've put incentives into the contractor's documents to say, well, um, you should use local labor where possible. There'll be some spin-offs in terms of retail, hospitality, transportation. And uh, the government indicated that there'll be funding made available in the affected areas uh, for community development initiatives. And there'll be a visitor center constructed next to the power plant to provide both school children and tourists with the um, op opportunity to view the plant and ask questions and to understand it, um, a little more about it. Land is always an interesting one. There's approximately 13 properties uh, or portions of properties that will have to be acquired. Um, th this has been probably one of the areas of, of greatest focus for the bank and ourselves to make sure that that's done in a way which is fair and uh, we call something called a resettlement action plan is required and that sets out the process for identifying the properties, how much compensation is due, how you calculate that, how you make sure that that's paid and everything is done in a way which is um, recorded so that people are paid the compensation that's due for them if they have to uh, move, move from their land. In most instances, nobody's living there. There's just two, pe two people that um, will be resettled. One of them will have to uh, have a piece of land purchased for him. The other one, I think, is take the money. Mr. Roll, take the money. Doesn't matter. We can talk about it afterwards. Um, the, the general community health impacts of the project are considered to be minor. We did talk about doing baseline studies of people's health. That's quite difficult. It's personal information. Um, what's naturally occurring, health problems, what would be an impact of the project itself. It's quite a tricky area to be in, so it's, it's not something um, where we would expect many, um, uh, any particular aspects to, to come up from it. But there will be some people who swear that I'm affected by this thing and this is how, and so you have to try and take a, take a view on that at the time. Um, safety impacts from increased traffic 
Uh, it's obviously something that we'll have to work closely with the community on. So I mentioned the, the traffic management plan. There's a worker code of conduct. So all the workers that come in, either employed locally or come in, will have to sign up to a code of conduct as to how they conduct themselves, how they interact with the local community, um, making sure that they're not doing things they shouldn't do, coming to work drunk, those kind of things. And as Mark mentioned, the World Bank finance is not released until all land has been acquired, paid for and received. And then there's ongoing social surveys as required. So in summary, the monitoring aspects, we've got the wastewater effluent quality, so that's the um, anything coming off the uh, plant um, will be measured. We've got the stormwater quality, which is around the sediment. You've got biodiversity, that's the ecology and measuring um, the impact on that. The slope stability, the geothermal features, the air quality, the noise and the social surveys. And the conclusions are that the overall there's a huge amount of technical information. Has anybody downloaded the ESIA? Good man, good lady. Did you read it? <laughs> you read all of it? It's not an easy read, but it does summarize a lot of technical information. We'll come to questions in, a, in just a minute, but yeah, you read it. The main impacts include noise, land acquisition, traffic, natural hazards, erosion, and uh, temporary changes associated with the construction. At the end of the environmental social impact assessment, you prepare an environmental and social management plan, and that sets out all the things that are required to manage the project over its life. And in the environmental social management plan, it says who will be responsible for them. Some of them will be the responsibility of the contractor who's appointed. Some of them remain the responsibility of the Dominica Geothermal Development Company. Um, and from the environmental social management plan, you put in place environmental social management systems. And they detail how those plans are actually enacted over time. Um, and the overall summary being that the implementation uh, at each phase will ensure that they are acceptable. Uh, do not expect that the geothermal project is going to create any, any unacceptable environmental and social impacts. It creates some positive impacts and any negative impacts. There's a mitigation and monitoring plan to, to manage those. I think that's enough talking from me. If you've got any more questions, Alan Germain. <laughs> no, Alan, Alan's the community liaison officer. Um, Importantly, there's a grievance mechanism. This is also part of the requirement for a World Bank standard um, environmental impact assessment. If you have any concerns and complaints, there's a process through which they must be recorded and responded to. Um, and this uh, comprises part of the, the project consultation. So that's, that's me. We can have some questions now. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, as well. Now, we are at the third part of this presentation. Question time. Anybody wants to go first? Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Almario Kazmi. I'm a soil scientist by profession with particular reference to allophane chemistry. Um, I've been following the development of the geothermal project with keen interest. I've actually downloaded all the information available in the public domain. Um, still reviewing the latest sets of reports. Um, in the review, there are areas that I seek some additional clarification based on cause for concern. The first thing that actually strikes my mind is with regards to this land settlement acquisition plan. Um, seeking clarification with regards to the report speaks about a 200 meter buffer zone and within that 200 meter buffer zone, based on aerial photography, some 88 properties were identified. Um, but yet still um, in the presentation, mention is being made of 
with immediate effect, floating properties will be acquired. So I'm seeking clarification with regards to futuristic land acquisition or acquisition process with regards to the buffer zones and the 88 properties identified within the buffer zones. So that's my first concern. And then I'll actually have three um, points to make in, in summary. My second point actually stems from the, the EIA reports and the methodology employed in actually developing the EIA. So Mr. Brooks speaks about aspects, um, impacts, but I was actually hoping to hear the word aspect before impacts. And in identifying the magnitude of this project, I was seeking clarification within the documents that would have actually given me a flow through of some environmental aspects looking at their impacts and how we are actually going to address them. Because um, of concern to me is in terms of the evaluation of the significance of the impacts. So having been schooling standards development myself, um, I was concerned with regards to how we actually went about looking at the scale of the impact, the severity of the impact, the probability of occurrence, the duration of the impact, the preventive mechanisms and the controls. For example, um, in the construction phase, and I relate it back now to the technology employed, so I'm actually jumping my presentation about because it's related. Because Mr. Tompkins said that tender would be actually made for the production process in question. But I was wondering that given the environmental concern and given the focus on green technologies for Dominica, would it be more prudent that we actually limited the bidding process to the single flash steam systems, given the fact that in the binary organic rankine systems that the environmental footprint there is actually uplifted by the fact that we are going to be using an organic alcohol to actually generate steam to turn the turbines. Now the concern comes from the fact that for the lifetime of the project, that material would be moved constant, continuously from the port of entry would be up to loader. So the environmental cost for concern there is actually elevated and it is to me not in keeping with the green imagery of Dominica. So in hindsight, would it not make sense for us to actually limit the contract bid to only single flash um, steam systems? Um, there's a, 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 a question that comes to my mind. Given the fact that, you know, we want to maintain the imagery of this green um, status. So that is of concern to me with regards to now um, defining the environmental aspects that we need to consider. Finally, of major concern to me is with regards to the reinjection wells. And Mr. Tompkins might need to explain some more on that. Um, actually, I read of verbatim that. I read verbatim from the, from the reports that the final alignment of the reinjection pipelines can only be determined following preliminary engineering design and geotechnical surveys prior to construction. Given the fact that um, further work is required to establish, and I underscore, the feasibility of river crossings. No, this is of major concern to me. Um, like I said, I'm a soil scientist, PhD in soil allophane chemistry. Um, when we speak about reinjection wells, one of the major things that comes to my mind is how much amount of geothermal tracer testing was gone into the establishment in terms of the hydrology between the production wells and the reinjection wells. So I read within the reports that further geotechnical surveys are actually required. So I ask in hindsight and in, in with good prudence that will geothermal testing involve tracer testing? And if yes, because based on the reads that I've been doing to cite Dr. Goodney Alexson from Iceland, one of the most renowned geothermal experts, which recommends the high use of geothermal tracer testings in actually establishing the connectivity. Because of the fact that, you know, we run the risk of cold front scalings and cold front coolings of the production wells if the reinjection wells are not properly aligned in terms of the hydrology. So given the fact that, yes, the network connectivity of Dominica is actually very, very elevated, how are we going to actually define the final alignment of the pipeline vis-a-vis -vis 
tracer testings. Because tracer testing, which is actually the highest science available to us in terms of that science, involves to a higher degree the use of radioactive materials, iodide-125, iodide-131, and to a lesser extent, other materials, colorated dyes, fluorinated dyes. So in, in further exploration before construction can include, I would like you, Mr. Tompkins, to really and truly give me a thorough technical explanation as to what is the process or what would, are the, the likelihood of these kind of activities taking place within the near future. Thank you. Thank you. In regards to the reinjection pipeline and tracer testing, etc. So, um, probably first just to explain the comment about the alignment of the pipeline. So, over the last 18 months, I suppose, we've been doing a lot of work looking at different route options for the reinjection pipeline. Um, Jacobs probably started the process. 2015, yeah. So a number of different options have been examined, uh, including routes that took it down past Trafalgar Falls and, and down the, the northern side of the valley. Um, all of those options now have been eliminated, apart from the preferred one, which is the one that you saw on the screen, for various reasons. Uh, some of the reasons include experiences from Maria in terms of being able to visually understand where there was unstable areas of land, um, in particular through the valley below the Trafalgar Falls, it became very evident with the destruction of the Domlek penstocks that that route is not viable for a, uh, a re-injection pipeline. Um, also through some areas there were more complex issues with land ownership so the route that we have come up to, which is the one on the, the diagram, really is a result of a, an iterative process that we've gone through to understand what has the least impact in terms of properties that we must acquire, because one of the premises of the ESIA is that we must first try and minimise the amount of impact that we will cause. So that means that we have to try and minimise the number of people affected by the project, which means that we have to try and minimise the number of displaced people and the number of properties that we acquire. So that's been a very important consideration and that's actually been a very complex process because land ownership and the designated titles thereof are a very um, difficult thing to pin down here. Um, it's, it's, it's not particularly well defined, but we've, we've put a lot of effort into that. So the route that we've picked now really is a best compromise between minimising disruption to landowners and minimising the amount of uh, engineering required to design the pipeline, minimising the length of the pipeline because there's obviously a cost to build it and a cost to operate it as well. And also, um, importantly, considering its resilience and its ability to be placed in such a location that we believe it's going to be um, most resilient from any natural disasters, in particular, slips are of great concern. Um, so the area that we've, we've chosen, uh, we've actually undertaken some geotechnical studies, um, which we completed about a month, month and a half ago now. Um, so if you happen to have been up in the, in the area over the last few months, you may have seen we had a drilling, a small drilling rig up there that we were using to undertake a geotechnical examination of the soil conditions. So we've been looking along the power plant site and along the reinjection line to check that the soil conditions are adequate for the construction of the pipeline. And we're, as a result, we're very satisfied with that. We believe that we have confirm that we're, we've chosen an area that, that is fundamentally stable. Um, th does that sort of answer your question about the, the routing sites? It's a, the, the comment 
just, just to clarify a little bit further, what we're giving the contractor in the, in the bid documents, we're giving him a corridor in which he can build his pipeline. So we're saying, here's a corridor. It's not very wide. It's only, it's only about 50 meters wide. And we're saying, you must build the pipeline within this corridor. That corridor is our preferred route. So he can't just go and say, actually, I want to build it over there. He has to build it within that corridor. But we're giving him flexibility to build anywhere in that corridor so he can optimize his pipeline design. So he has to take responsibility for that. So we must give him some degree of flexibility. So that the comment in the ESIA is really referring to that degree of flexibility that he has within the corridor. But make no mistake, the corridor is the corridor. And it's on the basis of that corridor that we are instructing the government to acquire those particular properties or strips of properties uh, affected by it. Does that answer that, Park? Okay. Um, tracer testing. Now, I should add I'm an engineer, not a geoscientist, so... Um, <laughs> uh, tracer testing has been done uh, between Wells Oath... P1 and O3, that's right. So P1 and O3 are on the same well pad. It was, it was done to establish uh, the degree of connectivity between the wells um, because the plan at the moment is that obviously we're drawing production fluids out of P1, but what I didn't mention is that we are also planning on injecting some fluids in O3 a very small quantity of cold fluid that comes from the cooling system. It's not the primary injection. The tracer testing, I recall, showed that there, there is some connectivity between the two wells, but at the level of injection we're planning for O3, it is of not, it's not deemed to be of any concern in terms of the cooling effect on P1. I believe that's what the report said from memory. Um, we haven't done any other tracing testing from the other re-injection wells because of the separation and distance. We don't have a pipeline to, to, to complete the circle. Um, if indeed we discover that even during our retests that the production well um, potentially has issues or during the course of when the plant goes into operation, we still have access to this $9 million of contingent financing, which is grant money, to go and drill another well, which is more than enough to drill a well. A well costs in the order of 5 to $6 million. So at the moment, there is, there is some risk with the wells. Um, in natural fact, with a, with a green field, and what I mean by green field, I mean a, a, a field that hasn't been developed before, there is always some risk that your first wells may not behave exactly in the way that you have modelled them to behave. There's a risk. There is a risk with any geothermal development. That risk only will diminish once the plant goes into operation and we start to understand over a period of months or years what the behaviour of those wells are. And as we learn more and more about the well behaviour, we'll understand more about the resource. And in that way, we can start to manage the process. And if, in the course of that, it looks like the production well is going to decline or a re-injection well is going to cease to be sufficiently um, able to absorb the fluids, then we have the ability to access this finance and drill a new well. Does that answer that question, I hope? Okay. Right. Technology choice between the, um, the two plants. Good question. Why have we left it open? The main reason we've left it open fundamentally is to try and increase competition and get best cost, best value for Dominica. Um, both technologies uh, are very similar in many respects, apart from the, the primary cycle. So the binary plant has a closed system uh, in, in terms of the, the heat transfer, whereas the condensing plant is, is an open cycle. 
Um, your question was, why haven't we opted to go for the condensing plant? Well, competition largely. We want to make sure that we have as many potential bidders as we possibly can to drive the price down. And at this size of plant, a 7 megawatt plant, is by world standards very, very, very small plant. Typically, geothermal plants are more on the sort of 50 to 70 megawatts or, or even larger. New Zealand has plants up to 100 megawatts as a single unit. Um, at that size, 7 megawatts, binary plants or the organic Rankin cycle plants can be competitive. Can be. There's quite a few players or quite a few providers now in the market that have entered into the market in the last few years and are starting to make that part of the market more competitive now. Traditionally in the past, there was really only one, maybe two providers of that technology, but that's changed a bit now. So from a, I guess from an environmental impact perspective, uh, the binary plant does take a larger footprint, so it will require slightly larger earthworks, so it will have a slightly more negative impact from that perspective. It does produce less visual vapour, um, but as I said, it's also less efficient. So it means that it's, it's a, from a long-term perspective, it means it's, it's, it's not going to generate as much electricity longer term for the amount of steam that we have in the ground. So in terms of, uh, I guess, concerns about the production well and its ability, a binary plant is actually a higher risk from that perspective because, because it requires more steam to generate the same amount of power as a condensing plant, it has a higher risk profile in terms of that well not being able to provide sufficient steam. So a condensing plant has a lower risk profile because it requires less steam. Um, yes, well that's true, but it's a bit of a closed cycle thing anyway really. So um, I mean I've, I've, um, I've been working on geothermal projects for 25 years. Um, I've been involved in both technologies, condensing plants and binary plants. Um, you know, honestly, in terms of the long-term impacts, there's very little to choose between them when, when you're operating them from a visual perspective or a, or a, a noise or other perspective. Um, yes, we could narrow it down to condensing plant, but I think we'll end up with a a poorer overall result for Dominica in terms of not being able to get such a competitive bidding process. Does that answer your question? I'm not, I'm not sure if I have or not. Okay, all right. Um, I think the next one was about... I think the next one was around how the impacts were assessed? Was it based on the probability of occurrence and uh, how it was calculated? Um, is that right? You could talk. You could probably talk. Okay, well, well, I was seeking clarification was that, okay, yes, the EIA does report on the, um, the probabilities of certain things happening. But what I was seeking clarification was, was the alignment to the principles of ISO 14000 series, which speaks of the environmental management system plans. So for example, um, in, in looking at your impacts, I was looking throughout the reads that we would have identified the aspects and then look at the impacts with regards to the probability of occurrence, go through the matrix process of trying to see the significance in terms of any impact that the project would have environment on the socio-economic livelihoods of the communities affected. So the, all what I was seeking clarification was the methodology. Yes, I have seen within the reports that it does align to a certain degree, but there were certain gaps that I was critically looking for, specifically in terms of critical impacts that does affect the, the, the longevity of the project. Unfortunately, 
I was not see that forthcoming. So for example, it did not critically address in any degree of detail the scale of impact of any of the aspects that would have been identified. It did not give any detail of the severity of the impact. It did not give detail of the probability of occurrence. It did not give detail of the duration of occurrence. It did not give detail of the preventive mechanisms nor of the control measures. All it spoke about was that these aspects or impacts will be reduced to acceptable levels. And to me, that at that level, we need to actually show the critical areas as to how it is going to be done with regards to preventive mechanisms and controls. Um, that was my, my, um, my, of course, concern for me. So I was seeking clarification on that, but um, it might not be part of that, uh, of that discourse, but it, 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 it alludes to that in some of your technical, as, um, technical appendices, um, where you have actually gone to try to elaborate on some of the concerns that I have there, but it still falls short in terms of the critical assessments as per the outline methodology as as described by the ISO 14000 series, environmental management systems, because yes, we spoke about the OP, um, the OP 40403 um, World Bank's um, um, performance standards, and I've reviewed them. They align themselves to environmental management systems, but they still fall short critically in areas that need to be addressed or um, given the, 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 um, the scale of that project. So that is where I was actually seeking clarification. Now, I still didn't get clarification with regards to the discrepancy between the 200 properties identified within the buffer zone and the 13 properties being proposed here. I did not get clarification on that. So I would still like further elaboration on that. Um, All right, let's, let, let's come, come to the 14, you say 14,000, ISO 14,000. So that's an international standard and environmental management system. Um, it doesn't apply to the environmental impact assessment itself but it will apply to the systems which are put in place. Now, whether or not DGDC chooses to be accredited to ISO 14001 is a decision that I don't know has been made. Um, but that's something you could, you could follow up on in, in time. And there is, of course, some subjectivity into determining how large an impact is and how severe it is. That's based on their expertise the particular people and in discussion with the reviewers and the other experts. So it was reviewed um, by environmental specialists in the bank, World Bank, but also by their regional safeguards advisor who looks after all the um, Americas, Latin America and Caribbean. Um, and to be honest, for a project of this scale, the impacts aren't major. You know, when you come and see what a major impact is when you go and build a whole new town or a whole new city or you build a dam like the Three Gorges, those are what they consider really major impacts or irreversible impacts. The project in Dominica is, is of, um, uh, not to say the impacts aren't real, but they're not as major as you see around the world from a lot of projects and that is their context in which they evaluate them. Um, the comment on the buffer zone, so you're talking about the 200 meter buffer zone around the Montois Piton National Park, which was never fully, it, it was recommended as a, um, that no further development be undertaken there, I believe, um, as part of the UNESCO um, management plan, a recommended management plan to ensure that the, the project doesn't, or sure that the sorry, that the, um, the site isn't affected unduly. Is that what you're referring to? What are you referring to? Yeah. I'll actually get to the report. It speaks of the pipeline corridor from the production well to the reinjection well. Okay. And it speaks of a buffer zone within that pipeline corridor. And within that pipeline corridor, the 88 properties has been identified by aerial photography. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that, that is what I'm actually um, referring to. But I will actually get it in the report so I could actually properly address the audience. Yeah, I, I think I understand what you mean. Yeah, hi. So um, I think understanding your question. So it was, it was about the, some of the initial commentary in the documents which talked about a very wide corridor and a number of affected properties. Okay. So it would be fair to say that that was initially the case, but since that time, as I said before, the work has been done to successfully, successively 
narrow down the corridor width for the pipeline and to narrow down the number of properties affected by the pipeline, which is where we're at now. So now we're, we're down to having a defined number of 13 properties that are affected and a narrow defined corridor. So the original discussion around a much wider corridor and a number of affected properties is, has been largely, well, not largely, has been circumvented by where we are now. Okay, anybody else? Oh. Mr. Douglas. All right, thank you very much. Now, my question is more straightforward. Straightforward. Um, given the crucial role that expertise from New Zealand is playing in, in this, in this um, project, could you give the audience a, a, you know, an appreciation of the role of geothermal energy in, in, the, in the economy of you know, New Zealand? You know, the, you know, how much capacity, for example, does New Zealand have in geothermal? You know, how long have that capacity existed? You know what I'm saying? That, 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 that's, the, you know, that's the first question. Um, the, the second question is, in terms of the size of the plant, there have been, my understanding is that that plant is basically for local consumption, to replace diesel, uh, except for standby diesel, but to replace diesel for local consumption. But do you have any mandate in terms of the export dimension to Guadeloupe and Martinique down the road, which would require much, a much larger plant? Because my understanding, the current um, capacity that we're dealing with is seven or nine, and you can correct me on that. What is the current capacity? And, and in terms of your terms of reference as consultants, um, are you, are you um, giving any advice for the down the road larger plant, or is that something totally unrelated to your current mandate? So I have two questions, one relating to the expertise and capacity, duration, and so on of New Zealand, since that's the source of the advice, technical advice. It's good for the public to be aware of that you know, from the horse's mouth. And secondly, the, um, the size of the current plant and its possible linkage to another plant down the road for export of energy. Thank you. OK, thanks for your questions. Um, so, in terms of the context in New Zealand, um, so we have, I think you saw on the slide, we have just over a thousand megawatts of geothermal generation capacity in New Zealand, uh, which is over, I couldn't actually tell you how many plants we have, it must be, ten is it, ten? Okay, about ten plants, Alistair thinks. Um, that represents about I th we think from memory it's about 19% of New Zealand's generation capacity. Um, quite a number of the plants have actually been built in the last 10 years, um, really in response to the fact that New Zealand has been successively shutting down thermal plants that we used to operate, so plants that were burning coal or gas are slowly being taken offline and geothermal plants are largely replacing them. Um, as part of a transition in New Zealand towards hopefully 100% um, renewable generation. Um, so I guess because New Zealand was the second country in the world to have a geothermal power plant, the first was Italy in actual fact, um, we have a long history of working with geothermal plants and it's part of the reason why we're here today. Uh, because we've been working with geothermal plants around the world. Um, I guess benefits to the immediate communities, well obviously um, they, they generate some, some local employment uh, during construction phase and, and also through operations. Um, but there are also some other sort of subsidiary, um, uh, I guess, industries that grow up around some of these plants sometimes as well. Um, I'm not quite sure what the opportunities are here, but for example, uh, in, in Kenya, where I've done a fair bit of work, um, they actually use geothermal uh, energy and geothermal steam for heating um, glasshouses for glowing flowers, a uh, big industry in Kenya. Um, so there's, there's, there's indirect and direct uses for geothermal energy. Um, sorry? Drying. Drying, yes. Drying milk powder, yes, that's right. Yes, Alice has just reminded me. It's also used for things like 
New Zealand has a big dairy industry, so geothermal is also used in some areas for drying um, milk products and producing milk powder, for example. Um, yes, so your second question, yes, this plant is, it, it was, it's been described as the small scale geothermal plant. It's, it's sort of being rebadged in recent times as the domestic plant. It's entirely intended for domestic consumption and its purpose is, as you've correctly pointed out, to displace or replace the diesel generation units, um, mainly the ones over here in Foncole. Uh, the longer term ambitions of the government are to construct a second plant, which would be a what was originally described as a large-scale geothermal plant, but it's sort of being rebadged now as an export plant. Uh, this plant, as the name would suggest, would be intended more as a, an export plant. Uh, and the intention there is that, that this plant would be built uh, with a much larger capacity than the one we're talking about here and would be connected to most likely the neighbouring island of Martinique, uh, via a subsea cable to export electricity. Uh, and Dominica would benefit from that in the form of a tariff to sell the steam uh, from the geothermal resource to that operational plant. I can tell you that discussions on that are underway um, and that there is a consortium who has been in discussions with the government uh, around that. The timing for it is still some way off um, and to a large extent, they're largely waiting to see how the small-scale plant performs and how the resource behaves as well. Because an important consideration with geothermal is, is not to start off with something too grand and too big. You start off with something small, you test the resource and you make sure that the resource is sustainable and it works in, a, in, a, in, a, in an expected manner before you then look to drill more wells and develop it. So it's, it's, a, it's a stepwise process that you do with, with some care and attention to make sure that what you do ultimately is sustainable. Does that answer your, your question? Yes. Seven megawatts, yes. Yep. So seven megawatts. Um, 7 megawatts has been selected as, uh, there's a couple of reasons for it really. Um, the one is a very technical reason, uh, that the 7 megawatt plant is actually going to comprise of, of two smaller units, 3.5 megawatt units. And the reason for that is that we have to work in, um, uh, what's, the, what's the, it's an easy way of expressing it. We, we have to consider the electrical distribution network in Dominica, and we have to consider the size of your other generational plants, in particular the hydro plants. So what we do for the domestic plant has to be able to work electrically with the other units, which means that there's a limitation to how big each unit can be, because in the event that for whatever reason one of our units trips and goes offline, there has to be something to make up the difference. So our units can't be too big, otherwise it has a big impact on the network and what you can happen in that situation is you can end up with the whole network collapsing. So it's, it's a delicate balance to make sure that what you put in works well with the existing network. Um, and actually you made an interesting point which I didn't touch on about um, standby diesel units. Um, it's, it's, uh, I can, I can, I can, I'm pleased to report that there's, there's a separate project which is kind of working alongside us, uh, being, uh, well, it's basically a grant from the UAE, and they're going to provide a battery storage system which is intended to be in, installed at, uh, alongside the diesel generation units at Foncole. The purpose of this unit fundamentally is to act if you understand these things as a standby, electrical standby unit. It means that Domlek will not have to keep a diesel generation unit running on standby. 
in case one of their other units trips. It means that the battery can be used to act as a standby unit and come online and provide power if one of the other generation units trips, which again limits the size of our plant to 2 by 3.5. And that's significant because it means that, it again, it reduces the, the environmental impact. We don't have to have a diesel unit sitting, running on standby, ready to pick up load um, if it needs to. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to, my name is Lloyd Pascal. I'd like to thank the gentlemen for their presentation and thank the company for convening. I have a concern with regards to um, the social impact. Um, it is explained there that the World Bank has a policy that unless all the land is acquired and so on, they will not start to deliver money and so on. Um, has the, the professionals involved in the EIA considered the question of um, land ownership? I mean, the people living in the valley where this plant is going to happen and whose land are going to be taken away from them, even if it is going to be exchanged for money, Land ownership is something that is very important for people, um, you know, this is what they have to leave as inheritance for, for their children and so on. And um, it, it seems like consideration is not given to whether the people who have the land could be part of this company, could be receiving a monthly or yearly income from a geothermal company instead of just selling their land, have nothing to count on because this is what we used to go to the banks, this is what we used to live for our children and so on. I, I think this aspect of social impact has not been considered based upon the report that I saw. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is with regards to financing. We talk about all of the attraction, and it is because you put it on the presentation that I'm talking about it, because I see nobody from the World Bank there to answer, but based upon the new situation that exists in Dominica have been, having been um, destroyed, devastated by Hurricane Maria, we think that neither the World Bank nor the government of Dominica should be negotiating for any kind of loan to do anything, not to build houses, not to build geothermal. We believe that the strength of Dominica's conviction as a small island developing state should negotiate grants only from the World Bank so that whatever it is that we are building, because we understand climate change as something that is fully the responsibility and of, of the developed countries of this world. They are the ones that are owner and managing the World Bank and we think we deserve, as a small island developing state, we deserve every single cent that is coming from the World Bank to do any kind of development after Hurricane Maria should be grants because we even with this plant there is no arrangements to sell much than to try to extract enough money from the consumers of Dominica to pay the bank back up that money. And it is my conviction that based upon those people who are responsible for creation of this climate change problem, that they, in fact, in 1992 in Rio, they signed an agreement called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that they promised to provide the financing for developing countries to fight a change. This is our turn. Maybe Dominica should be the example, just like the guinea pigs of what climate change can be to our people. We should be example of how the World Bank responds to us by providing grant funding for our geothermal plant. And um, another problem that maybe has not been considered is the price of electricity. Will this new plant really reduce the price of electricity to the consumers? Because we see when it comes to distribution, we talk about one planting loader that will be distributing um, 
power to people all over the place, like Dailies and Boetica and so on. I mean, you know, we know that there is the question of line loss and so on. Maybe that is another technical um, issue, but we needed to know if we will get a reduced price to the consumer in this new geothermal plant. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks for your questions. Um, we're probably going to answer those in reverse order, I suspect. So um, your last question about the um, impact of the geothermal plant on the electricity cost. What I can tell you is that um, the work that's been done to date in terms of looking at the, the, the impact of the geothermal plant displacing the diesel plant will reduce the electrical tariff and Domlec is required to purchase the power from the geothermal plant. So we have an agreement with Domlec which requires them to take all of the power from the geothermal plant and pass the cost on as a pass-through cost. So they don't make any money out of it and it's a pass-through cost. The impact of that will depend on a number of factors. Um, it's a little bit hard to put numbers against it because it depends what Domlex tariff will do over the next few years. They've obviously got some impacts from Hurricane Maria, network building, etc., etc. So I can't really give you a number, I'm afraid. But it will have a, a positive impact, i.e. it will reduce the tariff to the customers. Because primarily, that's one of the prime drivers for the project, and one of the key things that the World Bank is looking for is to reduce the electrical tariff in the country and therefore encourage development of Dominica. So it's, it's an important consideration. Um, land, land ownership, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the land, you're absolutely right. Land is, is, is an important thing. Uh, people associate themselves with the land um, and certainly where I come from in New Zealand land ownership and, and particularly for the, for the Maori is, is a very important thing they associate themselves with the land the land and themselves are one and the same thing unfortunately to build a project we do need land there's no escaping that we have over the last two years as I've mentioned spent a lot of time looking at how we reduce the land that we require and reduce the number of affected properties. We have also in that time been in discussions with various landowners to understand, and, and it's part of the SII process, what the impact of buying or acquiring the land from them would have on them. And that's helped to shape where we've routed the project and what lands that we require. People have the option under this process to say, I don't want the money, I want another parcel of equal land. And we have one, I think we just have one person that wants that at the moment. So one person has said, out of those 13, we want a replacement piece of land. And we're obliged, or the government's obliged to find them a piece of land that they consider to be equal to what they've got. So they can do a land for land exchange. The other affected parties have all said that they prefer to have the money. It's their choice at the end of the day. Um, all that we can do is try and minimize the amount of affected people, which we've done. Um, we've, we've actually tried as far as we can to use state-owned land. So there are some areas the pipeline runs over as state-owned land. Some of it is land owned by Domlek, and which we will run over their land as well. So we're trying to reduce the impact. Um, yeah. Leasing then, yeah, okay. So lease, leasing is, is also an option. So landowners, if they say, well, look, no, we don't want to sell the land to you, but we're happy to lease it to you. That's also on the table as well. And in fact, we have, 
now I think about it, we do have one, one of the affected landowners that, that actually wants to lease the land to us. And we have no problem with that. As long as the leasing arrangement gives us access for the life of the plant, 50 years or whatever we deem it to be, and then no issues with that. So the land ownership will remain with the affected landowner. So we're not, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're not trying to impose a certain regime on the landowners. We've been talking to them and we're trying to work with them to come up with a solution that works best for them. Yeah, I was going to just, I mean, the, your comment on the financing and grant financing. Um, I obviously can't speak for the government as to how they view the world and what they think is appropriate, but I can speak from my experience working in international community. And there's a lot of people would be happy to take money as grant money. And there's quite a lot of people that are happy to give money as grant money, but there's always a but. So you would have remembered David Cameron said, OK, we're going to give £300 million to the Caribbean region to help with infrastructure projects. Part of our discussions involved talking with the UK about that. And they said, OK, well, yeah, we'd like to give some money, but it needs to be an infrastructure project that isn't power. Or we need to be providing all the money, uh, or more than 50% so we can badge it as our project. Um, so whenever there's money given, it's given with, um, it, it's very rarely given without any sort of, I say tie, but without some political will that's been gained from it. So I can understand why it would seem appropriate to receive money. Obviously, Maria has devastated the country. Why would you borrow money to rebuild? It's going to take a long time to pay it off again. But the reality is that there's not enough money. I mean, there's lots of countries around the world that would take free money to go and rebuild stuff. And this project wouldn't be seen as a high enough priority when you're considering schools, education, roads, whatever else you might need to get the country operational um, for this to, to rise above to the point where it's com completely grant financed. And actually, when, when I look at what the financing package is, $10 million from the UK as a grant, that's a lot of money. $2 million from SIDS, it's also a lot of money, and $2 million from, from New Zealand, that's actually half of it funded by grant, and that's a pretty good effort in my eyes um, for a project which in other countries you'd develop on a private basis. So um, whilst I empathise, I think it's, um, it's not so easy just to get what you call free money, grant money, there's always a tag, and um, the World Bank has to... Basically, the World Bank's an arranger of finance for this. They have money that they loan. It's a bank. They loan money. Yes, it's very cheap money, but it still has to be loaned and recouped. They have to operate themselves. They, you know, they, they can't just be an administrator of funds. Now, they, take, they make applications to the Clean Technology Fund. They're administering the UK money, but they are channeling money from the international community through to the project and through to Dominica. Um, but to say it could all be grant financed, well, it will take even longer to try and achieve that. And there's only a certain window of opportunity where that money's available. So the UK had a five-year program. They had 20 million pounds for geothermal in the Caribbean. They haven't dispersed any of that money yet, and it's 2019, because it's taken so long to get there. And the UK government says, well, if you can't spend it, we'll use it for something else. So um, Dominique is actually going to be the largest recipient of that funding. St. Vincent's going to get £4 million. The rest of it will probably go back to the UK. So um, it, it's, it's not always that easy you know, to, to get free money or cheap money. I shouldn't call it free money because it's not really free, but to get grant money and to spend it in a way which is acceptable to the people that are giving it to you. Okay, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in keeping with the time frame that we have, we'll take maybe one, two questions more. Senator Charles. Um, good morning to everybody. Good morning to the team. Now, in um, coming here this morning, there's a lot to digest. First of all, in my view, if you're not technically inclined, it might be a little bit difficult to understand the many terminologies that have been used, and more so, the grassroots man, the man on the ground, would want to know, um, you know, those, break down those terminologies. My concern is really, is the awareness part of it. I do know, by my own knowledge, that there have been 
um, sessions on the project in terms of community awareness. But I believe that there needs to be more and a lot more because I don't think the average person can really grasp the extent of this project and the, especially as it relates to the um, assessment part of it, uh, environmental impact assessment. I believe that is fundamental. The other thing, and it's more of a comment than a concern, is that you made mention earlier, first speaker, I can't remember your name, but the first speaker made mention of the World Bank and that the World Bank is almost there in putting the project or confirming the project, but there may be one or two issues it's concerned about. I would just really like to know what, was the, what, is, what are these concerns? Um, because I think it is important because after the period upon which we have embarked on the project, taking in consideration the various uh, like, you know, storms that we have had and so forth, but maybe we could find that out and do that. The other thing is, the third one I really want to talk about is whether or not, if we look at the situation with Domlek now, it appears to me, and again, I have a lot of reading to do. I would have to you know, do a lot of reading in order that I could understand everything from a holistic point of view. But in terms of Domlek, it appears to me that Domlek will be taking over the, the distribution of the power. Am I correct to say that? No. And they will be taking power. And that is, to me, is a private company. And I do know that when these companies do what they do, they do it as a profit. My question is, is whether or not, at the end of the day, and I believe Mr. Douglas mentioned it, I, at the end of the day, the, the dollar value, I would really like to know, at the end of the day, what is the perceived or the, the rate at which, because that's what the average man will really understand. Today I pay 10 cents, tomorrow I'll be paying 5 cents, and is that really the case? Or is this is a case that will be manipulated by Domlek, or, or Domlek will decide whether or not that is, uh, that is the case, okay? Now I also want to talk about the land acquisition. I think it is a little, as an attorney at law, and I am also from the Roseau Valley, I'm also a senator, and I'm also a politician. So it's a lot of people in one, put it this way. But the concerns of the persons have to be brought forward. The, the whole issue of the land acquisition, I don't think it's as, it's as easy as that. And I really want to support, I believe it's Mr. Pascal, point. that at the end of the day, we have experienced it with Dominic. We're from the Roseau Valley, we know that. That at the end of the day, what is the project is going to give back. It cannot just be just a matter of, let's say, quote-unquote, getting cheaper electricity. It, it must be more than that because you have um, persons from the community that will be affected in one way or the other. So I definitely would like to get some, you know, um, clarification on that because land acquisition is, is serious things. And we have to, and I believe you need time to to really make the people understand what they will be losing, put it this way, uh, versus to what they might be getting back. And the whole issue on whether or not the amount of persons that will be engaged in a seven, seven kilo, kilowatt plant, how many employment we're looking at? 10, 20, how many engineers? Do we already have these engineers in place? Do they need to go and study? Um, are they going to be from the Rose Valley, Dominica by extension, or are these going to be consultants? I mean, to me, these are important aspects for the community in order that the, the community can see some benefits m moving forward. Thank you. Why don't I just, um, I'll start a little bit with the, the tariff and maybe Mr. Douglas can chip in as he's far more um, wise in these things than I am. But, but Dominic is a private company, of course. There's a regulator in place to manage the profits which they make and manage how much consumers pay. There's a piece of work that's ongoing at the moment um, with support from the French to work with the regulator to calculate the tariffs and to ensure that the 
uh, rate that is paid by the consumer is calculated within their weighted average cost of capital in a, rate, in a way which is agreed. I know they've been to court previously about it and coming up with agreement that happens in every country where there's a regulator because obviously someone wants to make more money, the regulator wants to bring it down, you hit somewhere in the middle. So to say what the actual amount will be, I, I can't give you an exact answer, of course, because the final price for the power plant isn't known yet. We haven't gone to market. You don't know how much the thing's going to cost. Well, you actually don't know how much it's going to cost until you've paid the last bill, but you do get a, a contract at the start that will impact it. All I could say is that um, in Dominica, around half of the, the tariff is on the cost of distribution and of running Dominic. The other half is on the generation cost. So the geothermal plant will have an impact on the generation cost. It won't have an impact on the distribution cost. Um, I'll let Mark, I'll let Mark talk. In terms of the engineers and Dominicans involved in the project, and um, we put quite a lot of thought into that as to how that can be included. The first step is to say, well, there isn't anybody in Dominica that's run a geothermal plant, so obviously they need some training, some education. The way we've incorporated that is into the contract for the, the constructor to have a two-year period where they stay on after completion in an operations and maintenance training role. And the intention will be that that would be Dominicans that fulfill those roles. Possibly they'll come from Dominic. Whether or not they come from the valley, I couldn't say. I think that might be a little bit much to ask. It depends who's skilled. Um, basic jobs around site clearing, security, and so on, you would expect them to come from the valley. In terms of the total jobs when it's in operation, um, probably 10 is a reasonable bet. Not full time always, but depends on you know what the stage of the project. And there will need to be experts brought in from time to time for um, technical overhauls, for reservoir monitoring, and, and for certain things that the skills will never reside in Dominica. I think just, just to expand upon what, what Alice is saying here, um, in terms of developing local skills and the ability to, I guess, um, make Dominica become more independent of managing this process and managing future developments. Um, that's part of the reason why I'm here and one of the things that I'm trying to do and uh, I have my, my team um, is to help develop local skill sets so that by the time I leave, um, the team I leave behind should be able to manage the plant and should be able to be involved, hopefully, in the, in the next development of, of future extensions to it or, or in a large-scale development plant. So the intention is, as far as we can, to help develop those skills. And you know, my, my objective, really, is to make myself redundant in this role as soon as possible and hand it off to the, to the local team. Um, I certainly um, fully believe in that process and fully believe in the need to upskill as far as we can um, local people to be able to not just manage the plant but to help develop it as it goes forward. Um, and I guess one of the things that's, that's quite exciting here is that there's a real opportunity here I think for Dominica um, given the size potentially of this geothermal resource to become uh, a bit of a hub in the region for expertise that could uh, be developed around the small scale plant and then the large scale plant as it moves forward. So I think, you know, it's quite an exciting thing really. Um, and it's certainly an opportunity to help develop skill sets around that. There's a comment that the ESI is very technical. It's raising. Yeah. Um, so the comment that you made about the SI being very technical, um, I, I would agree with you. Uh, unfortunately, necessarily, it, it needs to be of that nature in order for it to encompass sufficient details and develop plans from that that we can then enforce and work with. Um, there is there is a non-technical summary of the SIA, which is also on our website. Um, that is easier reading. Uh, and it is more accessible to, um, I guess, non-technical people. Um, I do take your comment on board about community engagement. Um, 
We are trying to do as much of these things as we can and it's always appreciated when we get a good audience. Sometimes when we do these things, we don't get many people showing up and it's a bit, it's a bit disheartening, to be honest. So it's, it's nice to see a good crowd today. We're doing another one of these in Portsmouth tomorrow and if we feel there's a need for some more um, maybe technically focused ones, then we'll certainly look at, at doing that as well. Um, we in the in the geothermal company we want we want to make this a success genuinely so we are trying as best we can to engage with the community and educate the community um, we have some other things going on at a, at a, at a I guess a different level um, Alan uh, in association with with Rawlins and Dalton uh, are currently going through a bit of a what would you want to call it, Alan, a schools education process? That's right, you a school to, education you program. Can you say a little bit more about what you've been doing over the last few months? Yeah. Over the last few months, we, we've been go, going around to the different schools to educate them about geothermal, what it's about, where it comes from, the different uses, because, like it or not, fossil fuel is coming to an end. We have no choice, you know? The other Caribbean islands now, they are now rushing to drill, but we are ahead. So we are going around to the schools to educate them about what geothermal, geothermal is all about, to let them know that um, there's a new industry that they could pursue. You have the doctors and the lawyers, but you can be a geothermal specialist, you can be a geologist, like we have a geologist right here. So we are exposing them to this industry so that they could um, make a career choice in the future. Yeah, and, and I think you know, that's important that we do that. We're trying to encourage young minds. I think, you know, just coming back to the SIA for a moment, we do have the non-technical summary, which I, I would encourage you to, to have a look. And I would also say that our door is always open. You know, if you've got some questions, you want to come and see us, we're just in Kennedy Ave, the, the door is open, we would encourage people to come and talk to us. That's what we're there for. So please don't sit and just say, oh, well, these people never talk to us. Our door's open, come and talk to us. So we would encourage that. In fact, we'd welcome it because it's a way for us to also engage with the community and understand concerns and hopefully we can, we can take those into consideration and maybe make some adjustments as required. That was it, there was one. Is there anything else? Uh, um, right. Maybe Mr. Dr. Douglas would like to maybe give us a short um, overview on how the rates are calculated. Because he asked a question about the rates, didn't you? Ronald. Yes, yes. I, I just, you know, I'm a, I'm a former member of the Independent Regulatory Commission. And for the benefit of those persons who may not be aware of it, the, 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 uh, the price of electricity really is regulated by the Independent Regulatory Commission in Dominica. There's an act called the Electricity Supply Act became law of the land, I believe, in 2006. So it is in that arena. So for example, Domlek cannot arbitrarily change the price of electricity at all. It can only do that through the IRC. And you know, that is the procedure. And so, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing is that currently, the, 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 the um, you know, distribution in terms of power in Dominica is certainly when I was in the IRC, it's about a third hydro and about two-thirds diesel. It fluctuates, of course, but is in, the, is in that range. And what we're talking about is the geothermal replacing the diesel. Okay? So, um, so hopefully, the one would make the, the price would be more, um, would be more less, less volatile. Because, you, are, you know, you have problems in the Middle East and, you know, in Venezuela. And, you know, so prices fluctuate. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, for example, they were talking about reducing the supply of, of, um, of crude oil coming on the world market because the price of lead has been, you know, declining. You know, so, so what I'm saying is that one would have more control over the price going forward. And from my understanding is that the intention is that the, based on the figures that I, that I have seen, that geothermal should come out um, cheaper than the, the mean for the last five years or so of um, you know, electricity prices, but then only God knows the future. The other point I want to mention is, for example, in, in 2016, I believe um, Domlek imports of diesel alone was about $45 million. So with geothermal, that would be off, off the table. 
At the same time, there are other costs, but the importation of diesel for generating electricity in Dominica, which is estimated in 2016 at about $45 million, would no longer be arise. And of course, the whole issue of the fuel surcharge, persons who um, buy electricity in Dominica would know that that thing is linked to the fuel surcharge, which fluctuates. So that would not be an issue anymore. So this, this is the context that we operate in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Toussaint, my number is up there. If you have any concerns, feel free to, co to contact me at any time. I understand the concerns. It's a new technology to us, but to the world, it's not really new. Let me give you an example or something to think of after you leave here. Most of us fly and we don't think about whether we're going to reach or not because we trust what's going on. A bit of history. Man started flying in 1903. Geothermal started in 1904. So geothermal is as old as when man started to fly. But it's new to us, so we understand your concerns. You have questions, we'll address them. But it's nothing new. Anytime there's something new, there's concerns. Remember the cell phone? It's going to explode in your ears, it's going to cause this. Remember that? That's how it is. But we understand that. So if you have any concerns, that's my number. And our office, our office is 18 Kennedy Avenue in Roseau. Mr. Charles, you know where I live. I mean, I live in the Roseau Valley. There is no way I'll be involved in a project if it's going to destroy my home. You know, so... I want to thank everybody for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. It was a very productive consultation. <laughs> Tomorrow, we'll be moving to Portsmouth from 5 to 7. But if you have any, any concerns between now and the future, please contact us. Once again, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank you very much for that, and I'm very interested you're going to schools and all. Um, I just wondered whether in, I know you jumped straight into the project itself, but whether there is explanation about why the hot rocks are there, our position on the edge of the Caribbean tectonic plate, how many, you know, uh, domes that we have with magma chambers underneath, and w what the source of this heat is and all that. I'm just saying so because one or two people who have attended some of these projects, like the picture you had in, in um, Trafalgar, were saying that it was rather complex for them to absorb. And I know it's very difficult to, to kind of explain something like this. So I was just wondering whether in the case of, um, you know, diagrams like how a typical geothermal plant works and what the connections are and the various um, uh, parts of the project. So I just wondered whether you, you had that included. I do talks for, as you know, about Dominica and I have a whole section on this. So I am interested to find out if you also deal with this. Thank you, Dr. Honishich. What we did before we went to the schools, we, we met as a group, we consulted, and we produced two PowerPoint presentations. One for the primary schools, because they are younger, younger minds, and we have one for the secondary schools. The primary school presentation has a lot of pictures. Uh, it describes what geothermal, the word geothermal means, you know. It, uh, it, it, it addresses where it comes from, how it is formed, the age of the earth and all of that. It also explains how we reach the resource and why we are volcanic. It's a tectonic plates. One question we always ask them is, how many volcanoes do we have? And everybody goes, nah, nah. You know, they know their stuff. We were very surprised, you know. On the secondary school side now, we go a little deeper in that we explain the different types of plants that we might use. <laughs> Apart from the basic knowledge about geothermal, we tell them about the plants that we might use, the benefits, the, the, the possibility of lowering the, the consumption of diesel, and um, the future export exportation of geothermal, uh, of electricity generated by geothermal energy. Because some of them were of the opinion that we drill 
We get the geothermal resource and then we pipe it to Guadalupe and Martinique. <laughs> you see? So we have to explain to them that no, we use the resource to generate electricity and then we export the electricity via undersea cable. So, and as we are going along, based on the, the, the reviews that we get from the, from the schools, we adjust the presentation to suit the next schools. So we are doing a, a very good job. We have two engineers with us to answer any questions. You know, I mean, I'll give you a typical example, all right? Most of us in Dominica, most of the kids know uh, power station. But at the beginning, we had a geothermal power plant. So we went to the school, and this young guy comes to me and says, on the side, you know, he says, sir, can I ask a question? I say, sure, that's what we are here for, to answer your questions. He says, um, where does a geothermal plant grow? Because in his mind, it was a plant. So we had to do some adjustments so that I explained to them exactly what it was. Because they had their own conceptions about what this thing is about. But they're excited about it. They know that um, it's an industry that's going to provide some new opportunities in terms of jobs. You can be a geologist. You can be there are so many things attached to this particular industry. So they now have a choice of directing their careers into that area. Very good, thanks. Welcome. It's not directly related to us, but I never found out what happened in the case of, of Nevis. I attended a workshop years ago when we, after the in-house workshop, we were taken up to the site. They um, opened, uh, you know, we saw the steam. Uh, we even had to put, um, uh, things to block our ears. It was kind of the, the sound of a, a jet engine. All of this was done. It all looked very impressive. And that was many years ago. What happened to Nevis and why didn't they... Um, was it all because of West Indies power and can failure I, of a company or what? Can, can I take that one? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So in, in my... Is that on? Yeah. You can hear me? In my travels around the region, I've been to Nevis several times. Um, first to, to look at what happened. So they drilled three slim wells in 2008, I believe it was, um, with West Indies Power, who subsequently went bankrupt. Um, they didn't fulfill their requirements of their concession, so they have a, you know, an agreement with the government there that said you can use the geothermal resource for a number of years based on the fact that you do this, this and this. Um, over the next three years, they kind of lost interest for a couple of years, and then over the next three years they ended up going to court um, because West Indies Power claimed that they still had rights there, um, and over that period eventually they were able to remove those. Then the US State Department came along, and I'm not quite sure what US State Department's interest in Nevis is. Um, it's really a, it's a little bit around resilience, it's a little bit around general influence, um, and looking at small islands as a um, test bed for certain policy initiatives. So anyway, they came along and they worked with the Nevis Island administration to find a new developer. And they went to market and they did a, a bidding process and they selected a developer. Subsequently, the developer um, is called Nevis Renewable Energy International, um, owned by Thermal Energy Partners, is a US-based company. Um, subsequently, they have been trying to raise the funds and put in place the actions to continue the exploration. Towards the end of 2017, they drilled a further well. The reason they had to drill a further well was because um, none of the results from the initial drilling were provided. They were kept because it was privately funded. Um, and so when they went to the bank, they said, OK, we've got the project. How about some money? And they said, yeah, fine, but we want you to drill another well, and we want you to do an environmental social impact assessment to a higher standard, because that hadn't been done. So that happened towards the end of last year, uh, sorry, 2017, uh, early 2018. And subsequently, I haven't heard too much more other than they're in the planning stages. They've appointed a engineer to act as an owner's engineer, who's another American company, and they will look to try and proceed that project. And the challenge that Nevis has got is there's very few people there, and there's not much demand for electricity. Uh, most of the demand for electricity comes from the Four Seasons Hotel, and uh, that's about to go a major renovation. So there's, there's, we looked at an interconnection between St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, politically, that's challenging, but from, a, from, from all the sense in the world, it, it would be a good idea. 
um, if the politicians could agree that it would be a good idea because it's not far and the resource looks good there and I would expect it to be um, you know, easily, uh, you know, power, power enough for both islands easily. Um, any of the gentlemen at the front um, from New Zealand? Okay, okay great. Um, because I was doing some research and I found out that um, New Zealand is one of the leaders in um, geothermal exploration and development. So my question to you is, what is the experience with New Zealand as opposed to Dominica? Do you guys have the same challenges, the same issues with regulation, exploration and, and all of that? Yeah, um, is it on? Yeah, it is on. Um, yeah, so, well, in fact, both of us uh, are from New Zealand. Um, as you can see from the slide, I mean, New Zealand has over a thousand megawatts of geothermal, and I think Alice to mention we have something in the round of, of 10 plants. The short answer is that, that we have exactly the same sorts of challenges in New Zealand. Um, plants in New Zealand can't just be built where people feel like building them. We have to go through environmental and social impact assessments. Um, a number of the plants in New Zealand uh, are also on um, our Maori land. Uh, so there's, there's often quite a lot of work with the, the Maori tribes. Um, and in some cases, there's trusts set up between the government and the Maori tribes to own and operate the plants. Um, in terms of construction and, and uh, I guess some of those challenges that we're probably likely to face here because of, let's face it, Dominica is quite remote and we're, we're going to have some additional challenges from, from that. that. That's not so much of a problem in New Zealand. There's, there's much more of an industry established around it. Um, and, you know, because we're, because we're going to be doing this here in Dominica, we expect that there's going to be some challenges around that. But the technology is, is very mature. There, there, there are a number of companies around the world now that, that produce plants for geothermal. Um, so that side of it is, is actually pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the, the complex issues here in Dominica are, are land ownership. You know, I touched on that. Uh, and access is going to be another concern. Um, but aside from that, really, they're, they're really not that complex to be perfectly honest, and, and um, there's any number of plants currently under construction around the world um, at, at, as we speak. So some additional challenges here, but from a technology point of view, not really. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Thank you. Um, simple question. Um, where can we get a full copy of the um, environmental social impact assessment? Okay. Just click all the way through the slides. So the short answer is, if you go to our website, the full copy of the ESIA is available on the website. Uh, Lynn, do we still have hard copies in the office if people are not able to access it off the internet? No, so we have a copy in our office in Kennedy Ave. If you can't access the internet, please come and see us at, at Kennedy Ave and you can... We have a flight drive for somebody if you wish, but not hard copies to give away. It's over a thousand pages. Okay. If you have any problems, come see us in Kennedy Ave and we'll see how we can help you out anyway. So the, the website has the full ESIA. And as Alan mentioned, it also has what's called a non-technical summary, so a short, concise document that, that tries to explain it in more layman terms, I suppose, if you were to try and, try and um, phrase how it is. Okay, is there no more questions? Any more? Okay. Okay, in reference to that plant, does it have anything to do with the use and transportation of gasoline? Because I heard a fellow this morning sharing his concerns. He, he came to be a doctor and whatever. 
So I want to find out whether that plant will be used in gasoline. Thank you. So, so your, your question is whether it will use gasoline, petrol? No, no. So the, the, the plant is entirely fueled, if you like, by steam from underground. The only gasoline that we might use in conjunction with the plant would be vehicles for use for service or maintenance. But other than that, it's driven on steam. Oh, hold on, one more. During the operation of the um, plant itself, what level of noise will be generated that could affect the neighboring communities? Um, so the environmental and social impact assessment did consider that, so it's been modeled. Um, the plant will generate some noise. Um, it depends what type of plant we end up with. There's, there's two styles of plant. Uh, the binary plant, the organic Rankin cycle, generates a bit of fan noise. So we have large cooling fans that are rotating. So it's a bit, a bit like a sort of an air conditioning noise in the background, if you like. The condensing plant uses a, a, what's known as a, a water tower, a cooling tower. It's effectively, it's a, it's a man-made waterfall. So it generates noise from falling water. That's the main noise. There'd be a bit of a, a background hum from the electrical equipment. Probably not that too, not too dissimilar from the hydro plants, if you've been past the hydro plants. So it, it sort of becomes a, um, a low-level background hum, if you like. Um, but we've, we've, we've gone to quite a bit of effort to try and push We've pushed the power plant as far away as we can from the village. And we're, we're kind of restricted by the, the World Heritage Site. We can't really go any further. So we, we tried to push it as far away as we can within reason. And distance, when you're talking about noise, makes a huge difference. OK, um, I think that's it. I would like to, first of all, thank the Minister, Honorable Ian Douglas, for attending this consultation with us. I want to thank you for coming because you have come to share your time with us. Time can be replaced. And we consider that to be a very valuable resource. So thank you so much for coming with us. Dr. John, thank you for being with We want to thank you all for coming. Um, this is the end of the consultation. As we've said before, if you have any concerns, get in touch with us. Call me, call Lynn, call any one of us. We will attend to you and make sure that all your concerns are addressed in the shortest possible time. Thanks again. Have a good evening.